I am the president of the Association for Library Service to Children, also known as ALSC. It is my singular pleasure to be your host this evening in New Orleans for the Newberry Caldecott, for the Newberry Caldecott Legacy Banquet. For those of you who are noticing that your printed program carries a different title for tonight's banquet, let me explain. Yesterday, the ALS board took action with significant input from members and other stakeholders to change the name of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award to the Children's Literature Legacy Award. We know that this decision will not yet be universally embraced by all. And I ask you tonight in our common house for your trust in our common goals. And I will sh share more about this decision later in the program. ALSC's vision is that our members engage communities to build healthy, successful futures for all children. As our nation practices racist policies to traumatize children seeking asylum with their families at our borders, incites hatred, undermines the integrity of the free press and our very democracy, I personally sometimes find it challenging to see clearly to this vision. But I know that libraries are cornerstones of empowering communities and that well-crafted stories, whether visual, oral, or literal, can feed the capacity for creativity, resilience, and joy in children. And I know that are, there are a thousand people seated here with me this evening who understand this too, and I treasure the opportunity for all of us to be together tonight to applaud the illustrious story makers who are helping us to achieve our vision. Tonight, we celebrate our award winners together. So I begin with some housekeeping notes. Please silence your cell phones at this time so that they do not disrupt the ceremony this evening. Exits are located at the back and along the sides of the ballroom. Please note the exit nearest your table. The cash bar is located at this back corner of the room. And finally, restrooms are located to the right as you leave the ballroom, and additional restrooms are located one floor up. So now that housekeeping is out of the way, it is now my honor and delight to welcome the president of the American Library Association. Everyone, please put your hands together for Jim Neal. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jim Neal, and I'm the president of the American Library Association for two more days. <laughs> On behalf of ALA and its outstanding staff, I am deeply honored to welcome our esteemed medalists, the chairs of the Newberry, Caldecott, and Legacy Selection Committees, the ALSC board members, our outstanding publishers and editors, and more, and the authors and illustrators that we celebrate here today, and my extraordinary librarian colleagues who strive every day to bring joy and freedom through reading to the young people across this country. I recall the Mel Brooks film, History of the World, Part One. <laughs> there is a great scene when Brooks, as Moses, is coming down the mountain carrying three large tablets. Children of Israel, I have 15. Oops, he suddenly trips, and one of those tablets crashes to the ground. He picks himself up, he proceeds down the mountain, Children of Israel, I have 10 
Commandments. I think we all would applaud the loss of those five additional rules, but I have discovered them, and allow me to share them with you. <laughs> Commandment number one, read books. As Anna Quinlan said, books are the plane and the train and the road. They are the destination and the journey. They are home. Malcolm X said, my alma mater was books, a good library. I could spend the rest of my life reading, just satisfying my curiosity. Commandment number two, preserve our liberties. The freedom from, the freedom from and the freedom to. What Alexander Pope defined as the ability to see what friends and read what books I please. Or as the former Librarian of Congress noted, knowledge is never used up for it increases by its diffusion and grows by its dispersion. Freedoms. Every snowflake in an avalanche pleads not guilty. Don't let it happen. <coughs> Commandment number three, protect school libraries. <clears throat> and the librarians who serve children and youth. We cannot do our work in public libraries. We cannot do our work in academic libraries without the groundwork that the people who serve children and youth provide in our school libraries and in the children's services in our public libraries. Steven Spielberg noted that only a generation of readers will, gen will generate and spawn a generation of writers. And as Margaret Fuller observed, today a reader, tomorrow a leader. We must stop the closing of school libraries. The, <clears throat> the erosion of resources that enable us to acquire reading materials and the elimination of school librarian positions, particularly in communities serving students of color. President Obama said, at the moment that we persuade a child, any child, to cross that threshold, that magic threshold, into a library, we change their lives forever, for the better. It is an enormous force for good. Commandment number four, teach young people to accumulate books. We all probably have the affliction of buying books that sit on our shelves and which we pretend to actually have read. <laughs> it's okay to teach this to our children. <laughs> Arnold Lobel said it best, books to the ceiling, books to the sky, my pile of books is a mile high, how I love them, how I need them, I'll have a long beard by the time I read them. <laughs> Commandment number five, write books that reflect the diversity of our world. As Roald Dahl tells us, so Matilda's strong young mind continued to grow nurtured by the voices of all those authors and all those illustrators who had sent their books out into the world like ships into the sea. These books gave Matilda a hopeful and comforting message. You are not alone. I discovered a commandment six. <laughs> Get books 
and get librarians into the refugee detention centers on our southwest border. It's an abomination that we are being blocked from reaching out to those children and providing them with reading materials, story hours, and the help they need to deal with the extraordinary emotional trauma that we have imposed on them. Okay, let me have some fun now. Edward Robert, the Earl of Lytton, tells us, we may live without poetry, music, and art. We may live without conscience and live without heart. We may live without friends. We may live without books. But very few people cannot live without cooks. We may live without reading what is knowledge but grieving. We may live without hope what is hope but deceiving. We may live without love what is passion but pining. But where is the person who can live without dining? <laughs> so as you get ready for your dinner, <laughs> remember what Somerset Maughan instructed us. At a dinner party, one should eat wisely, but not too well, and talk well, but not too wisely. <laughs> Enjoy your dinner, and thank you for having me here tonight. Good evening. My name is Tish Wilson. Being a member of the 2018 Randolph Caldecott Committee has been a once-in-a-lifetime journey for each of us on that committee. We, Fortunate 15, completed personal, professional, and geographic journeys to get to this evening in New Orleans. It's my honor to int introduce to you to the 2018 Caldecott family. Please stand as I call your name. And for you and the audience, please hold your applause until all of the members are standing. Naftali Ferris, Sarah, Sarah Flathman, Claudia Haynes, Marika Jeffery, Anisha Jeffries, Jean McDermott, Heather McNeil, Emily Nanny, Hedra Packman, Katie Sallow, Dean Schneider, Aaron Stefanich, Sylvia Vardell, and Michelle Young. Thank you all. Okay. <laughs> Each of the five illustrators honored tonight has made his or her own journey to get to this very special evening. For each book is a journey unto itself. The Randolph Caldecott Medal is awarded annually to the illustrator of the most distinguished picture book for children published in the United States in the preceding year. The 2018 Caldecott Committee chose four honor books. I'll use the words of my committee members to describe each book. In alphabetic order by title, they are Big Cat, Little Cat. <laughs> Big Cat, Little Cat, illustrated and written by Elijah Cooper, published by, by Roaring Brook Press, an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. The effective use of black line art, carefully placed on white pages, introduce us to the journey together of two cats, close friends, until one day, the older of the two cats had to go away. He didn't come back. And that was hard until the day a new cat comes. 
And so the journey of life continues. Elijah Cooper, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for Big Cat Little Cat. Force Museum, they call that a grip and grin. <laughs> okay. Oh, mm. Crown, an ode to the fresh cut. <laughs> illustrated, illustrated by Gordon C. James written by Derek Barnes, and published by Deneen Milner Books, a line of Agate Bolden. Gordon's impressionistic oil paintings glow with life as they capture the journey of a young boy as he experiences the bravado, swagger, and joy of the barbershop, an African-American tradition and institution. Gordon C. James, Please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut. Oh, look at that. Look at that. A different pond. <laughs> Illustrated by T. Bowie, written by Al Fai, and published by Capstone Young Readers, a Capstone imprint. T's evocative, thick blue-black ink brushstrokes create, create an early morning journey of a father and son to a fishing pond the two fish for the food that will be the family's meal that evening. This early morning journey recalls that of the father's life in Vietnam before coming to America. T, T Bowie, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for a different pond. <laughs> Illustrated. <laughs> this is now on my life list. <laughs> Grand Canyon, illustrated and written by Jason Chin. Published by Neil Porter Books, Roaring Book Press, an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. A father and daughter journey through this national park from the inner gorge to the south rim. Jason's art for this journey is created in great detail using pen and ink, along with watercolor and gouache. Sweeping landscapes culminate in an epic gatefold panorama at book's end. Jason Chin, please come forward and accept the Caldecott Honor Citation for Grand Canyon.
I've adopted all these authors and illustrators. I don't have any kids. These are my kids now. Oh. And finally, the recipient of the 2018 Randolph Caldecott Medal for the Most Distinguished Picture Book for Children is Wolf in the Snow. <laughs> Illustrated. <laughs> Illustrated and written by Matthew Cordell and published by Fewell and Friends, an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. Sorry about that. <laughs> In this spare, nearly wordless picture book, a red-coated girl and a young wolf cub separately get lost in the snow and rescue each other. Matt uses pen and ink and watercolor wash to capture the frenzied snowfall and this brave girl's frantic, frightful journey. A strong use of color and geometry provide an engrossing, emotionally charged survival story. Matthew Cordell, on behalf of the 2018 Caldecott Committee, it is our privilege to recognize you and your achievement and to present you with the Randolph Caldecott Medal for Wolf in the Snow. I can't imagine a more personally significant city uh, to be accepting the Caldecott in. Um, I've long admired New Orleans for its uh, strength and resilience, beauty, its very diverse culture and uh, artistic history. Uh, I think New Orleans represents our country and its people at our very, very best. Um, and there's a saying sometimes heard, oh, I agree. There's a saying that's sometimes heard uh, here around here at Mardi Gras time, and it goes, uh, laissez le bon temps rouler. Yes, which, if you aren't in the know, means, um, don't worry, it's not anything perverse. It means let the good times roll. So let's let the good times roll, my friends, yes. And let's listen to some speeches, okay. Um, when I was five years old, I wanted to be a stuntman when I grew up. When I was 10 years old, I wanted to be a ninja. When I was 15 years old, I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. When I was 20 years old, I wanted to be a graphic designer, suddenly a realist. It wasn't until I was a whopping 25 years old that I had any indication that I wanted to make books for children. By that time, I'd met a brilliant and beautiful young woman. <laughs> one, one who would change my life in so many ways for the better. Julie was and is a writer and a school librarian. I was and am, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I was and am an artist. <laughs> uh, we'd been dating seriously for some months, and she eventually had the bright idea that we could collaborate on a thing that she'd write and I'd draw, and we could try to get a children's book published. To which I thought, well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> I was an artist making art for grown ups since, and, uh, since I myself had turned into a pseudo grown up, and I couldn't fathom at all how making a children's book could be cool or respectable in any way. To be fair and also apologetic right now, 
I hadn't looked at picture books uh, since I myself had been a child. I hadn't thought about them, and when and if I did, it was in this warm and wholesome, didactic and uncool sort of way. Boy, was I wrong. Okay. Surprisingly, Julie wasn't inf- was not offended by my indifference, and she went ahead and wrote a picture book manuscript, Toby and the Snowflakes, it was called. It was about a boy whose best friend moves away. When a snowstorm starts, this sad boy imagines the falling snowflakes to be the voices of some new friends, and it changes his dreary day into a hopeful one. I read it. I put it down. I went and did something else. Surprisingly, Julie still wasn't offended by my indifference, and she started showing me picture books that she loved as a child and bringing home contemporary ones from her school's library, and this changed everything. I'm a visual person, so when I started looking at the fantastic and wobbly drawings of the likes of William Steig, Quentin Blake, and Jules Pfeiffer, I was immediately intrigued. It just so happens that at that time, I was also becoming uninterested in adults. As I slowly sank into proper adulthood with an adult job, with adult friends, doing adult things, I became very unsatisfied with it all. Adults were judgy and annoying. Adults were pretentious. Adults were jaded. On the other end of this human spectrum, children rather terrified me. (laughs) With their keen, sometimes brutal insightfulness, their unpredictability, and their unrelenting energy. I hadn't lived around or in a child's world for quite some time, so these little enigmas were foreign territory to me. They were far better than me and much more evolved. But I knew enough to know that children, unlike many adults, are profoundly accepting of so many people and things. And they are odd and funny in the most imaginative of ways. And because of it all, they were more approachable than I'd once figured them to be. The more I thought about children and about the art of children's books, the more tremendously inspired I became. I drew some pictures for Toby and the Snowflakes, and Julie and I put together a proposal and submitted queries to 20 publishers. We received 19 answers in the form of rejection letters. The 20th answer was a maybe. After about six months of tinkering with the manuscript, Toby and the Snowflakes was accepted for publication by Houghton Mifflin. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Once I got my hands and, ha- and head and heart all the way into it, working with Julie's wonderful text, collaborating on the art with the talented, sharp, warm folks at the publisher, seeing a book through to publication, and sharing it with this refreshing new audience of children and families and educators, I fell completely in love with making books for children. And I knew right then that this was the thing I needed to be doing for the rest of my life. We have to open our eyes and ears and hearts to the people and things we don't know or understand. If we stop seeing and listening and learning, we will surely miss opportunities to bridge our differences. We will surely miss opportunities to achieve greatness. Writing did not come easy for me but I really wanted to write and illustrate my own books. Back in the day, I wrote many fantastically terrible picture book manuscripts that were politely rejected by the editors and art directors who liked me for my illustrations. My skin thickened and I persisted, and eventually I cracked the code for what worked for me. I discovered that the best way into a story was to root it in something that was true to my own life. My first written and illustrated picture book, Trouble Gum, (laughs) was roughly based on the good-natured pranks my brother and I like to play on unsuspecting family members as children. My next book, Another Brother, (laughs) was about a funny moment I remembered when an obsessed toddler cousin of mine subconsciously copied everything his older brother did. So I made a book about 12 toddler sheep that copied their older brother. When I had children of my own, the blinders really came off for story, inspiration, and ideas. Unbeknownst to them, I subtly rip off the unbridled brilliance of my children daily. (laughs) So I had found what worked, 
and I never wanted to return to the days of making a story out of something completely unfamiliar to me. But then came a day when I did just that. Now, this is the part of my story we'll think, where things will start to get embarrassing. But not too many people are going to hear about this, right? <laughs> it was the year 2013. The ALA Youth Media Awards were soon to be announced. My book, Hello, Hello, had a bit of buzz swirling around it. So for the very first time in my career, I actually had a book in the uh, Caldecott conversation. And oh, I wanted it. I wanted it so bad. <laughs> Late that night, before the awards were to be announced, after the rest of my family had gone to bed, I closed the door to my bedroom studio. I dimmed the lights. I took a book off of uh, my shelves, and I made a pencil rubbing of the Caldecott Honor sticker <laughs> from the cover of Interrupting Chicken. I cut out this gray wannabe silver circle. I thought if I did a Caldecott honor instead of a Caldecott, the universe might look, look fondly upon me. Um, I taped it to a copy of Hello, Hello. Then I looked at my book with its faux sticker and I did some hardcore visualization. I chanted. I meditated on it. I'm not a very religious person, but I may have prayed, even, that I would get one of those dreamed about early morning phone calls. I turned my cell phone ringer all the way up. I got under the covers. I closed my eyes. One sleepless night, an unbearably long morning later, that call did not come. And I was crushed. We illustrators are a sensitive bunch. <laughs> but the embarrassment doesn't end there. <laughs> the next day, wallowing in self-pity and angst, I drew a picture of a wolf howling sadly at the moon. <gasps> and in the face of the moon was a very subtle rendering of a Caldecott medal. <laughs> I posted the drawing on Facebook. <laughs> I don't think anyone picked up on my Caldecott moon. It's possible they did, but it was just too awkward of a thing to mention. <laughs> At any rate, the drawing, it helped. Turns out when you're feeling blue, it's cathartic to make path pathetic passive-aggressive art. <laughs> Furthermore, I found myself quite drawn to the wolf itself. I had never thought much about wolves before. Wolves are kind of creepy and dark and vicious, or so I thought. So I drew some more wolves, and I liked doing it, so I drew some more wolves. Then I drew a wolf and a girl. The drawing was very minimal, but very dramatic. The girl and the wolf were standing in a white, snow-covered field, facing each other, close in proximity. The wolf was solid black and mysterious. The girl was in a bright red triangle-shaped coat, also mysterious. I liked the graphic quality of the red, the white, and the black. What was it? I didn't know, but I was surely going to post this drawing on Facebook. <laughs> to my surprise, I received many inquiring and encouraging comments, such as, is this a story? And you should write a story about this to which I thought, don't tell me what to write. <laughs> the truth was, I'd actually been thinking some of the same thing. Was there something more to these characters? I did want to draw them again. I did want to find their story, but it had been proven that pulling a story out of thin air was not my thing. So I didn't want to do that, not yet. Instead, I stepped away from drawing and I read about wolves. I learned about wolves. And what I learned was that much of what I thought about wolves was wrong, contrary to what I believed, contrary to misinformed thoughts about wolves, excuse me, contrary to misinformed stereotypes, 
Contrary to what we'd read in those old big bad wolf tales like the three little pigs and Little Red Riding Hood, wolves are not creepy or dark or vicious. Wolves do not hunt people. In fact, they want nothing to do with us. I learned that because of age-old stereotypes, wolves have been unfairly demonized and maligned by humans. Wolves have been hunted down, in some cases, entire populations wiped out, because of these sorts of widely believed prejudices. The truth is, wolves want much of the same basic things that humans want. Family, companionship, safety, survival. But because of misinformed ideas, people distrust wolves, and we hurt them for it. Wolves distrust people, and they fear us for it. All of it is wrong, but on it goes. I looked at this story that had played out between wolves and people, and I saw a similar story being played out today between people and other people. People who are angry or afraid or distrustful of others because of what they believe to be true. People who judge or hurt others because of differences in race, religion, sexual orientation. Suddenly, the story I was searching for between the girl and the wolf presented itself. A story of fear and misperception, yes, but one that ultimately leads to kindness and redemption. These are unfortunate, ugly times we are living in, but it needn't be that way. It can be better, we can all be better. We have to open our eyes and ears and hearts to the people and things we don't know or understand. If we stop seeing and listening and learning, we will surely miss opportunities to bridge our differences. We will surely miss opportunities to achieve greatness. I'd like to congratulate my newly minted Caldecott siblings, T. Bui. Jason Chin. <laughs> Elisha Cooper. And Gordon C. James. <laughs> On their esteemed accomplishments and beautiful books. Congratulations to Aaron and Trotta Kelly. <laughs> Derek Barnes, Jason Reynolds, and Renee Watson. Congratulations to Jacqueline Woodson, clearly I like applause. Um, it's an honor to share this very fortunate, amazing, bright moment in my life with you. I'd like to thank this wonderful, wonderful Caldecott Committee. I don't think you'll ever fully comprehend how I feel about you and all, about you all and what you did. I'm enormously grateful to each and every one of you now and forever. Thank you to every editor, art director, publisher, who has taken a chance on me and lifted me up and made me a better bookmaker. But of course, specifically, thank you to everyone at Fywell and Friends Macmillan who has helped my books, my career, and my craft over the years. Thank you so much to my editor, Liz Sabla. <laughs> to my publisher, Jean Fywell. and to my art director, Rich Dees. Thank you for having faith in this book and for helping to make it so much better. Thank you for your respect and friendship and collaboration. Thank you to my agent, Rosemary Stamola, for always believing in me and in this book and in all of my books. Thank you for having my back and Julie's too. 
You've seen me and my family through high highs and low lows, <clears throat> and we love you like one of our own. Thank you to my community of bookmaking friends who agreed to look at my sketches and came to my rescue many times as I was working on Wolf in the Snow. Most notably, my Chicagoland illustrator group, the Krusty Nibs, <laughs> Stacy Curtis, Larry Day, Tom Lichtenheld, Eric Roman, and Chris Shaban. Thank you also to talented friends Miriam Bush, Candace Fleming, Edward Hemingway, Mike Petrick, Ed Spicer, Mark Winter, Aaron Stead, and Philip Stead. Phil flew to New Orleans just to see me here tonight. Thank you, my friend. Special thanks to Kira Cassidy of the Yellowstone Wolf Project for taking the time to answer in depth my questions about wolves and wolf behavior. Thank you to the many teachers, librarians, and educators who have supported my books over the years. Thank you for your positive voices and for welcoming me into your schools and libraries. Thank you to the countless children who have enjoyed, appreciated, or bluntly rejected my books over the years. <laughs> Children are the better versions of the rest of us. And I feel so lucky to spend my days with them and to have them <clears throat> as my audience and friends. Thank you to all the art teachers who pointed me in the right direction and encouraged and inspired me to try harder. Teaching is an exhausting and selfless and all too thankless pursuit. More than ever, our children need heroes. They need look no further than in our schools and libraries. Thank you to Janice Halpern for your kindness and generosity. You're an invaluable part of the support system for me and my family, and I'm so grateful and blessed to have you in my life. Thank you to my mom, for your love and encouragement and support. Growing up, times weren't always so easy, and I know you took the lion's share of bringing up Eric and me. Your tenacity, work ethic, and self-motivation inspires me to this day. Thank you for making my childhood safe and special. As for my own fierce and fearless wolf pack, <laughs> at the end of the day, everything I do is for you. Everything I do would be nothing without you. So thank you most of all to my wonderful wife, Julie, our alpha wolf. <laughs> and our children, Romy and Dean. <laughs> Thank you for your endless patience, love, and inspiration. Thank you so much, Julie, for reintroducing me to children's books. Thank you for believing in me and supporting me. Thank you for putting up with my silent brooding spells. <laughs> the day I met you was the luckiest day of my life. <laughs> Thank you for leading our wolf pack into greatness. The last person I want to thank could not be here tonight. You see, my dad, my pop, he was slowly dying of pancreatic cancer while I was finishing the artwork for Wolf in the Snow. Oh. I didn't always understand my pop. 
He didn't always understand me, but he was so, so proud of me, and he loved me so much. I know because he told me so often. The one and only bad thing in all of this is that my pop didn't live long enough to see this most wonderful thing happen for me and my family. I don't get to feel his proud hug. I don't get to see his knowing, subtle smile. Wherever you are, Pop, I think of you every day, and I love you, and I miss you. And I'm grateful for all you did to make me a better person and to make my life a better life. Thank you, thank you, thank you one and all. Well, hello, universe. <laughs> a very big welcome to you and a good New Orleans evening to everyone. Uh, I'm absolutely tingling with excitement and joy to be with you celebrating the very best in children's publishing in 2017. Tonight is the culmination of 18 months of reading, digesting, notating, and discussing hundreds of books with a dedicated, passionate, tireless, thoughtful, and good-humored group of book super enthusiasts. <laughs> Talk about magnificent and fascinating. That's this committee. <laughs> Please hold your applause as I introduce them to you. Newbury friends, Please stand as I read your name and remain standing until I have called every name and you receive the acclamation of this appreciative <laughs> gathering. Oh, you are. Tell them. Mara J. Alpert, Tad Andraki, Anne Crudson. Janice M. Del Negro, Sue Giffard, Carol R. Goldman, Lori Coffey Hancock, Suhei Lego, excuse me, Lugo, Kirby McCurtis. <laughs> Sally L. Michalek. <laughs> All those Texans. Mary E. Parks. Anna Elba Pavon. Kathy Parter. Potter. Excuse me, Kathy. And Rebecca Thomas. Now. This year, the Newberry Committee chose three honor books. In alphabetical order by title, they are Crown. <laughs> An Ode to the Fresh Cut, written by Derek Barnes illustrated by Gordon C. James, published by Deneen Milner Books, a line of Agate Bolden. A boy walks into a barber shop, a prince walks out. Through lyrical free verse, Derek Barnes's joyous band celebrates the universal, transformative, confidence-building experience of a great haircut. Derek Barnes, 
please come forward to accept the Newberry Honor Citation for Crown, an Ode to the Fresh Cut. Long way down. <laughs> Written by Jason Reynolds, published by Kate and Lynn DeLuey Books, Athenam Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon and Schuster Children's Publishing. Terse, sharp, verse depicts a desperate teenager seeking to avenge the shooting death of his brother. Gun tucked into his waistband, he is shocked by the appearance of childhood friends and relatives on a chilling 60-second elevator ride. Visceral language and raw emotion result in a powerful novel of grief and vengeance. Jason Reynolds, please come forward to accept the Newberry Honor Citation for Long Way Down. Piecing me together. <laughs> Written by Renee Watson and published by Bloomsbury. I am learning to speak, to give myself a way out, a way in. Jay's Mixed media collages evolve as she finds her voice. Through artful and poetic language, Watson explores themes of race, class, gender, and body image in this dynamic journey. Renee Watson, please come forward to accept the Newberry Honor Citation for piecing me together. And now, the winner of the 2018 Newbery Medal for the most distinguished book for children is Hello Universe. <laughs> Written by Aaron Entrada Kelly, illustrated by Isabel Rosas, published by Green Willow Books, an imprint of Harper Collins Publishers. Filipino folklore and real life converge at the bottom of a well. Even while following signs and portents, the characters are the definition of creative agency. Masterfully told through shifting points of view, this modern quest tale shimmers with humor and authentic emotion. Erin Entrada Kelly, on behalf of the 20, 
2018 Newberry Medal Selection Committee, it is my great honor to acknowledge your distinguished achievement and present to you the John Newberry Medal for Hello Universe. Wow. Ah! Um, oh my God, look at this medal. I'm gonna take it everywhere, to the Target, to the shop, right? Okay, <clears throat> yes. Here we go, okay. <sighs> so whenever I sat down, a few minutes after I sat down, I leaned over to Cecilia and I said, Cecilia, I'm sitting next to Jacqueline Woodson. <laughs> and she said, Cecilia said, I'm sitting next to Aaron and Trotta Kelly. <laughs> I'm like, okay, but Jackie's a real writer. <laughs> okay, seriously. Um, I'd like to thank the ALA and ALSC. I'd also like to congratulate Derek Barnes, Jason Reynolds, Renee Watson, Matthew Cordell, Jacqueline Woodson, <laughs> and all the honorees. <laughs> I'm sitting next to her, you guys. Okay, um, I'm convinced that I've entered an alternate universe and that in some parallel reality, I'm on my couch eating Cheese Whiz in my pajamas. But since I'm here and you're here, I'll just say, hello, alternate universe. I'd also like to recognize my friends and family who are here tonight. I'm eternally grateful to my agent, Sarah Crow, with Pippin Properties. Yeah. I'm indebted to the team at HarperCollins, especially the people at Green Willow. In particular, Isabel Rosas, who drew the art for Hello Universe, Land of Forgotten Girls, and You Go First, and Sylvie LaFlock, who designed all my books. And I would not be standing here if not for my editor, Virginia Duncan, I should be able to find the right words to express my gratitude, but there are none. So thank you for challenging me. Thank you for believing in my work. And thank you for using a pencil instead of track changes. <laughs> I'd like us to travel through time together, if you'll indulge me for the next few minutes. I'm in a room full of big imaginations, so I suspect you won't mind. We aren't going back too far, just a few decades to 1970, where there's a beautiful Filipino woman with long, dark hair working in a restaurant in her home country. She is from a poor family. As a girl, she washed clothes in the river and slept in a Nipa hut with her 10 siblings. One night while she's working, she meets an incredibly shy American sailor. He asks her to marry him after one date. He doesn't even know her last name. Maybe she doesn't know his either, but she accepts on one condition. He has to meet her priest first. With the priest's blessing, he sails back to America where he promises to write, and he does. He sends her awkward selfies with his Polaroid so she won't forget what he looks like. Um, I've seen these selfies, and despite them, uh, she packs her few bags, <laughs> leaves everything behind, 
and moves from a tropical island to a small, cold town in Kansas to marry a man she barely knows. They have a daughter. She is bright, sunny, and cheerful. People stop them in the grocery store to remark on how beautiful she is. When she gets a little older, she'll learn to love books, especially Judy Bloom. Super Fudge becomes a favorite. She's a delightful child, full of smiles and laughter. Three years after this daughter is born, they have me. I entered the world afraid and full of questions. I was afraid of the dark. I didn't like to climb trees because I was convinced I would fall. I didn't scale fences or ride skateboards. There was nothing particularly extraordinary about me. I wasn't the prettiest girl at school or the smartest. I wasn't the quietest or the loudest. I was just a little Filipino girl born in Kansas and growing up in South Louisiana, trying to find her place in the world. There were two things that set me apart, however. The first was this. I didn't look like the other kids at my school. My hair was black and coarse, my eyes slanted, and over and over the other kids asked, what are you, what are you? It was a question I didn't have an answer to. There were no Asians in my neighborhood. There were no Filipinos in my school. The kids asked, does your family eat dog? Do you know the price of tea in China? I felt very alone in the world. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night when everything was quiet and dark and sit in a corner. There was a clock in my house. I listened to it tick. I felt like the only person on the face of the earth, and that scared me. The Scholastic Book Fair was one of the few things I loved about school. <laughs> it's not the Scholastic table. Uh, <laughs> um, my family didn't have much money, so my choices were limited. I'd circle items with a pen, scratch one out, circle something else. I'd smell the flyer the same way I smelled pages of books. It felt like home. The other thing I loved about school was, of course, the library. Yes. Every table is the library table in this one. Um, thankfully, uh, my school, T.H. Watkins Elementary, had a library. It was a special treat when Sideways Stories from Wayside School was there because it was usually checked out. I would imagine what it was like to go to Wayside. I pretended I was on the 30th floor watching Mrs. Gorf turn people into apples. <laughs> I pressed the worn, dog-eared pages and wondered about the other kids who were checking it out. Who were their favorite characters? What did they like most about it? I learned to escape through books. When I read, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret? I was no longer a scared little girl in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Instead, I was whisked off to the magical wonderland of North Jersey. <laughs> when I read Blubber, one of my favorites, I was taken to the utopia of Radnor Township, Pennsylvania. <laughs> one day, very early on, I realized something. Books were nothing more than pen and paper, and I had both of those things. I started writing my own stories where things could be just as I wanted. It was then 1985, and I'm eight years old. Most emerging writers polished their craft by emulating their favorite books and authors, not me. Writing came so organically, I filled notebooks with completely original work I started a book series, for example, about identical twin girls who live in California, <laughs> and they go to a school called Golden Valley High. <laughs> yep. <Yeah>. Um, <okay. laughs> 
One of the twins is smart and bookish. The other is a popular cheerleader. I actually have an excerpt. This is my, to share with you tonight. This is, this is the Golden Valley twins, so it's totally different. Um, I'm gonna read to you from chapter four of book one, Almost Lucky, and the tagline says, is Sandy going to get the dream she always wanted? That's at the bottom. Author Aaron Kelly, illustrator Aaron E. Kelly. Right? Yes. Um, so this is from chapter four. Cindy and Ricky walked in a restaurant called Le Merci. It was expensive. <laughs> Ricky's parents were rich. They had over $1,000. <laughs> Cindy ordered oysters and a Shirley Temple. <laughs> Ricky ordered red wine, snails, and french fries. Cindy thought snails are gross. The red wine was called Damiano Estino. I made that up. When they were done eating, Ricky asked, do you want to dance? Sure. They danced to the song Gone with the Wind. Now, you can't see the illustration, but Cindy is in a full ball gown, and Ricky is wearing a tuxedo, because the 80s were a different time. You know, and they were 16, that's what happened. Um, my first hardcover, as you see there, was bound in cardboard. It was a book about two orphans who are best friends. I didn't have the incredible Lois Adams as my copy editor then, so the published title is The Two Orphans. <laughs> yes. Um, these two orphans live in an orphanage where they wore tattered clothing. I was particularly proud of that, tattered clothing. Uh, the copyright is 1987. When I got to high school, I listened to girls talk about their dream weddings. Who would be in their wedding party, what kind of dresses they would wear. We played games to guess who we would marry and filled the blanks of our sign-in books but I dreamed of the day a publisher would call because that is the second thing that set me apart, my big dream. When I wanted to disappear, when I felt small and insignificant in the world, when I had so many things to cry over I could never pick just one, I reached for that dream like a security blanket. I wrapped it around my shoulders and used it for warmth. That's what dreams do for people. And what does it feel like when dreams come true? It feels like a phone call from Cecilia McGowan <laughs> when you're driving down I-95, 30 minutes before the Youth Media Awards press conference. It sounds like cheers from a committee of people you have never met, but who have changed your life. It sounds like Cecilia saying, we've been calling and calling you and we finally got a good number. <laughs> Apparently they had the wrong one at first. Still not convinced they dialed the right one, <laughs> but they can't take it back now. <laughs> if you're trying to call Kate DiCamillo, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm often asked, to describe my ideal reader. And the truth is, I write books for my characters. For Virgil Salinas, who is shy and lonely and always picked last for basketball, or Valencia, who wants to be the next Jane Goodall but doesn't have a friend in the world. For the Madrid sisters, who long to escape into their imaginations. In You Go First, the main characters, Charlotte and Ben, sit alone at lunch. I write for them too, because I was and am all of them. My greatest wish as a writer is that the person reading my book, or any book for that matter, feels less alone. 
because I know what that feels like. I suspect you do too. When I was a kid, I didn't always understand why I was so sad. I would lie, I would lie awake at night, stare at the popcorn paint on the ceiling, and think about all the people in the world that I would never meet. I would wonder, what if someone out there feels the way I do? And we could become friends, but I'll never meet them because they live in another state or another country. It was a tragic thought, and I would overwhelm myself with it until I cried. But that's why we have books, isn't it? So we can meet those people, walk in their shoes, see our reflections, so we can discover that we never struggle alone. Books are an incredible gift, but without you, the book people of the universe, they would never find their way. To know that my books sit on your shelves and pass through your hands is an honor indeed. Which brings us to the present, to the universe we find ourselves in tonight. That little girl who wouldn't climb trees or scale fences. The little girl who prayed for blue eyes. She still exists. She's still wrapped in that blanket. But she's not alone anymore. She is in a room full of beautiful readers. She's at a podium in a new dress. She's surrounded by people who make dreams come true every day by putting books into the hands of kids and introducing them to a bigger world, a place where all things are possible. You have given me a tremendous honor tonight, and it's my hope that you will remember each day how you honor the dreams of underdogs everywhere. When budgets are low and tensions are high, when office politics overshadow your greater purpose, when you're paying student loans, when you're wondering why you had to get into this business instead of something less stressful and more fruitful, I hope you'll remember this story. It's a story that can be easily summarized. Once upon a time, there was a little girl and all her dreams came true. <laughs> time out. Um, but it isn't just my story, it's the story of you and me. Thank you. Yesterday, the Alice Ford voted to change the name of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award. <clears throat> We've changed it to the Children's Literature Legacy Award for significant and lasting contribution to children's literature through books, that demonstrate integrity and respect for all children's lives and experiences. As we made this, as we took this action yesterday, we're grateful for your patience as we update all the portions of our website that need updating and we'll be providing more information on our website. But I'd like to share just a few words with you about this decision. This decision was made in consideration of the fact that Wilder's legacy, as represented by her body of work, includes expressions of stereotypical attitudes that are inconsistent with ALSC's core values of inclusiveness, integrity, and respect. And that today, many white people are finally willing to admit are racist. While ALSC upholds the importance of access to Wilder's work for readers, the significance of her contribution to literature for children that continues to be studied today, and recognizes the important teachable moments therein, we also recognize that an award seal in itself is not a teachable moment. Is Wilder's exact lasting achievement the one which we desire to represent the honor we confer with this award? Most of you and the ALSC board were finally willing to say, 
Not really. No. The name Children's Literature Legacy Award more precisely acknowledges the respect we collectively confer upon those award winners. And I wish to thank all of you who have contributed to this discussion. I also humbly apologize to all of you who have had to sit so uncomfortably with this award for so long. I am grateful you are here beside us still as we finally move forward. So now I am so pleased to introduce Rita Auerbach, who has the honor of presenting the 2018 Children's Literature Legacy Award. It is indeed a great honor to present the 2018 Legacy Award to Jacqueline Woodson. I should begin by introducing the outstanding 2018 Legacy Award Committee. I'll ask each member to stand and, as we say here, please hold your applause until they've all been recognized. Vicki Ash, who could not be with us this evening, but it was, is with us in spirit. Susan Faust, Laura Koenig, Mary Lindgren, Our committee spent more than a year reading and rereading the work of some of the finest authors and illustrators in the history of children's literature. What a pleasure that was. We carefully examined the work of people suggested by ALSC members and by members of our own committee. Our understanding of this work was informed by the observations of our colleagues, and by examining books in the context of the creator's body of work. It was fascinating to see how the process influenced our appreciation of the work and gratifying to participate in our respectful and warm discussions. And how fortunate we have been to be able to honor Jacqueline Woodson. All of us who care about children's literature are indebted to Jacqueline Woodson for courageously addressing in elegant poetry and poetic prose issues of race and racism, sexuality and class, abuse and incest, the incarceration of loved family members, and many more once ignored subjects, as well as friendship, and family, kindness and trust, identity and love. As a member of our committee wrote, Jacqueline Woodson's range and courage are matched by her artistry. Jacqueline is the 2018-2019 National Ambas Ambassador for Young People's Literature. She was the 2000... <laughs> She was the 2015 to 17 Young People's Poet Laureate. She received the National Book Award for her memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, which also received the Coretta Scott King Award and was a Newbery and Seibert Honor Book. She has received three Newbery Honors, two Coretta, King, uh, Coretta Scott King Awards, and the Margaret Edwards Award. You get the idea. <laughs> and Jacqueline's poignant picture book, Each Kindness, a che teacher drops a stone into a bowl of water to so show her class that, quote, each little thing we do goes out like a ripple into the world. And that is what Jacqueline's fine books have done, going out into the world 
to challenge readers and shape their understanding of themselves and the world around them. In the other side, Jacqueline shows readers a fence that unites people rather than dividing them, ending with the hope that fences that divide us will be knocked down. Now there's a prescient writer. <laughs> but that is what her books do. They bring us together with insight and empathy. In her newest picture book, The Day You Begin, Jacqueline celebrates a world in which, quote, every new friend has something a little like you and something also so fabulously not quite like you at all. And that is what her books continue to offer readers. It is a joy to present the 2018 Legacy Award to Jacqueline Woodson. I know y'all are thinking, damn, we're finally near the end of this. <laughs> How many of you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> At least you're not sitting up here having to go. I'm jumping the line. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I just want to dedicate this to the ancestors in the room, including Robin Smith and Bill Till. Um, both of whom are dearly, dearly missed at this conference by me and I know by so many of you. Um, and geez, what an honor. So you had to write a ding dang speech, right? Because then they had to d put it on something so people could have access to it the minute you left. They left here, they could go download it. Uh, so. I wrote that speech and I'm gonna read it, but now it's different because every day things change, right? So the speech that you're downloading is not gonna be the speech that I'm reading exactly. <laughs> um, but it's, it's something I wrote. <laughs> And you wait, are awaiting the one thing that will infinitely increase your life. The powerful, the uncommon, the awakening of stones, depths turn toward you. Dimly there gleams on the bookshelves, the volumes in brown and gold. And you think of lands traveled through, of paintings, of the garments of women found and lost again. And all at once you know, that was it. You rise, and there stands before you a bygone year's anguish and form and prayer. Those are the translated words of Rainer Marie Rilke's poem, Remembrance, are in German, and forgive me, Er Inarang. Written in 1918, the many translations are all slightly different, the ab above remaining my favorite over the years. Still, every interpretation I've read of this poem has struck me. While translators come to it from their own experiences and thoughts about how it should be brought to the English language, the essence of the poem remains the same each translation having a deep respect for what the poet is saying and what the poet wants us to feel. Rilke was a writer of his time. Sent to military school as a young boy, he was rescued by an uncle who saw him for who he was, a gifted child, a lyrical poet. I think often about what it means to be a writer of one's time. 
especially now, during this time we're living in, where there are days, as the writers and artists in this room know, when we wonder if we will ever be able to create again at all. And when we finally do, because the truth of it is, of course we will. This is our lifeblood, our air, the way we have figured out how to stay sane and keep moving through the world. But when we finally create again, we will be setting the backdrop not only for the time for the time we're living in, but also showing who we truly are in this time. Our writing reveals us. It shows us the world, it shows the world who we are, how we think. It tells the world what we want. It is the deepest essence of our true selves, translated through character and setting and plot, translated through story. I've spent many hours thinking about how creative writing has moved through time, what has lasted and what didn't quite work for the not yet born readers, the so-called future generations. Rilke's poem is one I have kept in the back pocket of my brain since my early 20s, and every time I've needed to pull it out, it's been relevant and timely and moving. It's been a tough year. If we think not, we are either in deep denial or on hella good medication. <laughs> brown bodies, native bodies, white bodies, oh my lord, the brown and white and native bodies. The little brown bodies being separated from their families. The native bodies fighting for their land. The wealthy white bodies that saw, saw no more reason to live and took themselves out of this world. The young black bodies being brutalized or worse, killed by cops. The grown up black and brown and native bodies being mass incarcerated. The women's bodies are bodies. We write about bodies, we think about bodies. What is happening in our country right now is happening to bodies, to bodies that breathe and bleed, bodies that cry and laugh, bodies that were once babies, bodies that are babies, whose heads were sniffed, whose heads are sniffed, and diapers were changed, human bodies. For me and for so many like me, it's been art that has helped me get through the pain of everything. Jokes and memes and clever comments on Twitter, books and audio books, comic books, music, great thoughtful mo mu movies, the shy, Atlanta, blackish, grownish, even the occasional streaming by way of my son of the boondocks. <laughs> All of it has allowed me to escape, to laugh, to think, to figure out what more I could be doing. Many of you know I am a New Yorker by way of South Carolina, by way of a Christian and Muslim background, by way of a belief that everybody in this world has a right to be here. Every single one of us has a right to safely move through this world. But for too long, too many bodies have not been safe. I thought a lot about this talk how people, who want, how people who wanted to publish it and record it were asking for it like last yesterday in March. I had to keep saying, but we don't know what's happening tomorrow and I can't write a talk in March that would be completely irrelevant by May or June or July. I swear, it felt like I got the call and the next call was, where's your talk? So I did what writers do so well. I thought about the thing I had to write lots and lots, and then for a long time, I didn't write it. <laughs> the evening I got the call saying I'd be receiving this award, I was surprised. I was to find that this call was the beginning of a year of surprises <laughs> and facts. I was beyond grateful to be asked to accept an award that was a praise song to the work I've done. I never expected to write as much as I've written. I truly didn't think I had this much to say, I swear I didn't. <laughs> but the world keeps spinning and we hold on and try to make sense of this place. 
We try to make sense for ourselves and for our readers. We try to make sense of the past and get a, to get a grasp on our own futures. And for many, many years, I've been doing this by writing. So when the call came, I was not ready. I was not ready because I knew the story. I knew the lines in the beloved books that weren't kind. I knew of the minstrel show and of the disparaging remarks about native people whose land we walk, sleep, eat, love, fight, grow, and die on. I knew my own girlhood of wincing when I read lines from those books and saw illustrations that seemed dis to be dishonoring me. But how could this be? After all, hadn't everyone been taught what I felt like I heard every single day of my childhood? If you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. So when the call came, my first thought was, ding dang, isn't there a less controversial award they can give a sister? And then I thought of Rilke, of the poem I go to like prayer, and you wait, or are waiting the one thing that will infinitely increase your life. The powerful, the uncommon, the awakening of stones, depths turn toward you. And I thought, this is it, isn't it? At this moment, this is the only place I'm supposed to be here in this room with my fellow fabulous awardees, talking about what it means to be a writer who really does want to do the work that shines a light on the beauty of all people without picking and choosing whose body is worthy and whose is not, whose body should be looked down upon, warned against, deemed frightening. The work I was brought here to do is the work I'm doing and hope to continue to do. It is the work to make people feel safe and seen in this world, not just today, but for future generations. And not just thoughtful narratives, but narratives with no sharp edges, no demeaning words or phrases laced inside of beautiful stories. While I am deeply honored to be on this, this stage, while I am beyond grateful to the committee who not only chose me for this award, but continued to do the work of questioning and challenging the name until, name of it until yesterday, it became the Children's Literacy Legacy Award. <laughs> And all the people who needed my speech long before this moment will have to figure out what to do with this final version written this afternoon. <laughs> because as we all know, none of us are writers. We are all rewriters. <laughs> While I am grateful to my publisher, my amazing editor, the hardworking publicists and agents and assistants who helped they helped me, but who helped me get here. While I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my amazing partner and my amazing children and my family and my friends that are family. <laughs> and I will not mention because it always embarrasses her that my partner is the most fabulous doctor in the world. <laughs> and mom. <laughs> She has her prescription pen with her if you guys need anything. <laughs> Goals. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just love calling her out. <laughs> so so if I, was, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. While the past years have turned us upside down and back again, and the past weeks have reminded us daily how much work we still have left to do, I stand here reminded again of writing's complicated journey, how it continues to reveal us, how it continues to reveal ourselves to us, how it shows us our grace. But more than anything, my hope is that it continues to remind us all of the work ahead and the people we're doing the work for. 
the future generations, the young people who more than anything deserve a world they can spend their whole lives safely walking and running and jumping and reading through. In celebration of my, young, of my long journey, because I'm not young, even though I look young. I know I look very young to you, and y'all are asking, how is she up here getting this Legacy Award because she's so young? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the melanated in the room know that black don't crack. <laughs> <laughs> And you can't download that, so sorry. <laughs> In celebration of my long journey to this moment and the award's long journey to becoming the Children's Literacy Legacy Award, I again return to Rilke's final lines. You rise, and there stands before you a bygone year's anguish and form and prayer. Thank you.